What are the biggest challenges being raised to the Mormon church today? And how do they respond? Whether it's the plural wives of Joseph Smith, whether it's the Book of Mormon, DNA studies, translation of the Book of Mormon. In the past few years, there have been a range of questions that have been raised and the Mormon church has been responding. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And I don't know anybody more qualified than my friend Eric Johnson from the Mormonism Research Ministry. And a lot of people don't know this, but we actually co-edited a book together. I'll hold up just one time called Sharing the Good News with Mormons. And Eric lives in Salt Lake City, so he is a scholar and a writer and a researcher, but you are doing ministry, so to speak, with people, which is what I really love about you, amongst other things. So, Eric, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on, Sean. Well, let's jump right in, because I know people are going to have a lot of questions, and there's going to be a lot of interest in this topic. So, in about the 2010s, There was a lot of concern in the LDS church about young people leaving their faith. What spurred this concern on, and how did the LDS church respond in terms of the gospel topics essays? Well, we uh, believe that a lot of people did not know a lot about what Mormon teaching is about, about the history of it, about the... uh, 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 basically the historical issues that before the internet came about and became popular, let's say 1995 or so, really people didn't know anything. And then as the internet continued on and sites like ours, we have a website called mrm.org. Uh, there are other sites out there as well. utlm.org is another website with Sandra Tanner. Uh, information really became uh, prevalent as far as the real history of what the Mormon church is about and not the way that it was being portrayed in LDS chapels. And so in 2010 in November, there was a special uh, uh gathering of Swedish saints. It's been called the Swedish Rescue. And there was a guy by the name of Hans Motsen. He was an Area Authority 70. So he was was somebody who had some authority. And there were lots of questions being raised about issues such as the prophetic role of Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, is it a divine book or not, translation of the Book of Abraham, polygamy issues, blacks Mm -hmm. and the priesthood, DNA, uh, and the Book of Mormon peoples. These were all issues that their people were asking. And so two historians came uh, to try to deal with that, Richard Turley and Marlon K. Jensen, who was the head of the his church historical department. And they tried to appease the saints who had a lot of questions, and it was taped secretly. They didn't know it was being oh, taped, wow. but there were uh, tape recorders running. And so all of that is available on the Internet today. And, th- and we didn't learn about it. It didn't get released until a few years later, but uh, th- th- that is available for people to hear. Okay, so those of you who just joined us, I'm here with Eric Johnson of the Mormonism Research Ministry. And we're talking about how in the past decade or so, the LDS Church has been responding to some of the biggest challenges that before that time and really the ubiquity of the Internet, many of these issues were suppressed and a lot of people were not aware of them. So Eric, in your research and experience, what are the big reasons that Mormons will cite when they question their faith or many who've left their faith? I think those historical issues, many of the ones I just brought out, I think uh, the biggest ones we find are the Book of Abraham and the idea that Joseph Smith translated this uh, special papyri that he had purchased from a traveling salesman in 1835, and he said it was from Abraham, that Abraham actually wrote it, so he translated it that way, and um, that's not the case at all. Uh, So the Book of Abraham seems to be a big issue. For women, it's the polygamy issue. Uh, Joseph Smith Joseph Smith had uh, between 30 to 40 wives. The Gospel Topics essays admit to that in a footnote in one of the essays, 30 to 40 wives, and a third of those wives were teenagers as young as 14, and wow. another third of those wives were married to other men. That's not polygamy. That's called polyandry. That wasn't known by a lot of people. And then... Um, uh, the, the Book of Mormon's tran- the way that it was translated by Joseph Smith 
for many years, it was portrayed as Joseph Smith taking these gold plates that he dug out of a hill, the Hill Cumorah, and uh, they were supposedly written by um, an American group that used to be Jewish. They came over around uh, 700 BC, and these gold plates, Joseph Smith would run his fingers across, according to the portraits. Even in uh, the February 2001 Ensign magazine, an official magazine, it shows Joseph Smith using his finger and reading off of these plates. Well, it turns out that that's not the way it is, and we've known that before the internet. It was mm. known that he used a magic stone in a hat, and he would put the hat up to his face, and the letters would come. And so the church did not admit to that until just a few years ago. So those are, these are issues that have okay. created a big problem for many Latter-day Saints who are being told one thing in the church uh, Sunday school classes and in their seminary and institute classes that they take in high school and in college versus what was reality. And that caused a big problem. And so we've seen a lot of Latter-day Saints, especially uh, People who are younger, the millennials especially, who have left mm. in droves because they don't like to be told uh, lies. We're going to take a look at Book of Abraham, uh, the polyandrous relationships of Joseph Smith in some more details. But first off, you shared with me briefly before he came online a story of a couple in their 80s who came across these gospel topics essays, which were meant to answer the tough questions, but it actually created more disillusionment in them and they ended up leaving the LDS church, if I got the story right. Will you share that one with us? Yeah, you need to understand, too, this was only during a two-year period that they published these essays called the Gospel Topics Essays. It's found on the church website, churchofjesuschrist.org, uh, but it's not easy to find. Uh, and there are a series of 13 essays um, that were produced between 2013 and 2015. Uh, but Latter-day Saints, many of them heard about them. They started to look them up, and uh, this one couple came into Sandra Tanner's bookstore, the Utah Lighthouse Bookstore, in 2015. I volunteer on some Saturdays, and, uh, and so they came in and sat down in these chairs across from a table that Sandra has there, and a lot of conversations that take place, people come in to talk, and the gentleman, 80 years old, said, what do we do now? And we had hardly even introduced each other, and, wow. and, I, and I said, well, what do you mean, what do we do now? He says, we don't believe this anymore. We don't believe Joseph Smith was a true prophet of God. What do I do? Uh, what, is, what do I, my wife and I do? And I asked, how long have you been in the LDS church? And he said, 80 years. I said, 80 years? How old are you? He says, I'm 80. I was born into the church, and so was my wife. And so, uh, and so he wanted to know, he had no idea what to do, and uh, he had never been to a Christian church service, and he was asking questions like, well, what do you do when you go to a Christian church service? Because he had thought, he had seen in the movies Catholic services where they're genuflecting and all those things. Sure. He said, I don't know how to dress, I don't know how to act, but wow. could I go to a church? And so we had a chance to share uh, you know, gospel truth. He had already done some research on uh, Christianity, but uh, anyway, I invited him to come to my Bible study, he and his wife, and until COVID hit, they have been attending faithfully for the past five years. They're 85 now. Uh, he is a believer. She is still struggling, trying to come to grips with, because all of their children and grandchildren are LDS, and you have to understand, this is a very tight-knit family group, and if you leave sure. the church, could get shunned, and this is the worst thing that could happen to this woman. And so she she does not want to condemn her family by becoming an evangelical Christian and now accept the idea that people who don't have the true Jesus of the Bible could actually go to hell. And so and trust me, lots of a lot of conversations in our weekly Bible studies. We would get off topic. I, I'd like to do a, a chapter by chapter uh, look at any of the books we're going through, but we spent time going through all the issues they were asking about. They want to know all about the Trinity. They want to know about okay. hell. They want to know about those things. And uh, so anyway, it's been a beautiful relationship, and they are good friends of mine today. That is absolutely fascinating that somebody 80 in the church's whole life would have that courage and conviction and willingness to change given yeah. what it would cost him. Uh, I think that shows the depths of the challenges we're going to get into that the LDS church is facing today. Let's right. let's jump in and get specific. And then as we go through this, uh, it's great to see uh, some familiar names in the comments and some new names. We're going to take some questions for Eric Johnson as we get a little bit more to the end 
If you have questions for me about Mormonism and some of the biggest issues facing the LDS Church today, we want to give you a chance to ask him those questions. But let me start with a big one. This is more of a theological question. Has there been a shift in terms of how the LDS Church approaches salvation by grace, moving away from works towards grace, or is that too simplistic and not accurate? Well, the problem is when you are talking to a Latter-day Saint, you're going to use the same language, the same terms, but they have different meanings to them. And so when you say to a Latter-day Saint, well, I believe in Jesus Christ and he saved me by grace, and I believe the Bible is the Word of God. And the Latter-day Saint will be able to say to you, in, and, and they're being honest, yes, I believe the same things you do. That is not accurate, though, when you start to define terms. And so I always ask people, or I always um, advise people to ask the Latter-day Saint what they believe about such and such, and having an understanding enough of Mormonism to know what they mean. So okay. in Mormonism, they do believe in grace. They believe in the atonement. Those are the same words they will use, but ask them what they mean. Uh, we believe, for instance, let me use the word grace. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, we're saved by grace through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. I mean, we've all learned that. Awanas are teaching our kid, you know, kids, uh, those verses are very important verses. And, uh, and so they have a similar verse that they like to use from 2 Nephi chapter 25, verse uh, verse 23 in the Book of Mormon, which is one of their four scriptures. When you say scripture, you probably as a Christian mean the Bible. Right, right. Well, they could mean the Bible, the King James Version of it, uh, the Book of Mormon, uh, which was supposedly translated by Joseph Smith that I was talking about earlier, the gold plates, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. And so 2 Nephi 25, 23 says, we're saved by grace after all we can do. Okay. Now, there have been several different uh, apostles who have given sermons at General Conference in the past few years. Uh, there have been uh, 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 professors over at Brigham Young University, a Latter-day Saint uh, University, uh, who have also come out with things uh, that make it very much appear like they believe in grace. One way you can flush it out uh, is you can say, oh, so you believe you're saved by grace. Wonderful. Uh, so I guess you don't have to get baptized in the LDS church. I guess you don't have to go to the temple. I guess okay. you, know, you can go through all of the different requirements. And you have to understand salvation to a Latter-day Saint mind, there's two different meanings. One is general salvation, okay. and that would be a salvation that all people get because of obedience in a previous life called the, um, be, called the preexistence, that all of us were obedient and chose Jesus as the Savior rather than Lucifer. Two-thirds of the children did, one-third did not, one-third were cast out with no bodies, two-thirds, uh, all of us who are born on earth chose Jesus. And so we all get to go to one of three uh, kingdoms of glory, gotcha. the celestial, terrestrial, and telestial kingdoms, because of the grace of God, because of the atonement. But there's a second type of salvation, and it's called individual salvation, or exaltation, or eternal life. And okay. that's where a Latter-day Saint hopes to go through perfect obedience, and that's where they hope that they can be with their families together if they do the right work in the temple and get sealed to their to their um, their family. Uh, the wife and the husband get sealed, and then the automatically, if you're sealed there, your children are going to be sealed, and you'll get to be with each other and continue. Uh, you'll be, get to be a god in the next life as a man, and the woman will be a goddess. Now that's really helpful distinction to clarify what we mean by salvation, what we mean by grace. So you would say in terms of exaltation, there is no significant shift away from the kind of works like getting married in the temple, uh, keeping the word of faith, um, baptizing for the dead. All those are required just as much as ever to have exaltation in the church, and there's no shift away from that that you're aware of. No, uh, there is not. Um, okay. I mean, people ask, wouldn't you like to see that? Well, certainly I would, but I'm very wary whenever they speak twice a year, they have what's called General Conference here in Salt Lake City, where the different apostles and the prophets, they do believe they have modern day prophets and apostles, they will speak authoritatively, and when they speak, it's like scripture. And so with, uh, y you'll hear these sermons and it sounds so good, and you go, oh, look, but you have to read between the lines and you have to see what exactly they're saying. And again, the question I always ask is, oh, I guess that I don't have to do this, that, and the other. 
and uh, the, the requirements that Mormonism still holds to today. And they'll say, well, no, you need to do those things. Oh, OK. So you mean and, and then also another the old proverbial, if you were to die right now, would you go to the very best your religion has to offer? As Christians, we have First John 5, 13. We may know that we have eternal life. The Latter day Saint, that would be audacious. That would be egotistical to say that you know you have eternal life. And yet it says that even in the King James Version. So I like to bring that out and say, well, if you don't know you have eternal life, but you're trying, you're doing your best, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that justification by faith and faith alone is a done deal when you believe. It's not a continual process. We do have works. We call it sanctification. It's sure, a process sure. of working out our salvation with fear and trembling, as Philippians 2.12 says. But uh, no, I think if you get down to brass tacks, not only are the leaders not believing it, I don't believe the average Latter-day Saint believes that they are saved wow. by grace. Well, in 2 okay. Nephi 25.3, sure. you're saved by grace after all you can do. Ask the question, how much do you have to do? How much can you do? And there you go, because it, it, it's like this uh, hamster in the wheel. He can never get to where he thinks he can get to. Eric, by the way, there's some encouragement here from uh, Eric, uh, from Chris. He says, so grateful for Eric and Bill. I left the Mormon Church in 2012, and MRM, which is the Mormonism Research Ministry, was a big part of helping me understand the differences between Mormonism and the truth of Christianity. Thank you. So be encouraged, my friend. You're doing great, great work. I appreciate uh, that comment, and that uh, those kinds of comments really keep us energized to continue mm -hmm. to do what we do. So I appreciate that comment. Well, I know it's an uphill battle. Those of you just jumping in here, with we're with Eric Johnson of the Mormonism Research Ministry, and we're talking about the ways that the LDS Church has been attempting to answer some of the biggest challenges that have been raised against historical, scientific, and theological claims of Mormonism. Let's move on to a big one. Uh, in his King Follett sermon, Joseph Smith taught, quote, you have to learn how to become gods yourselves. How embedded is the idea within the history of the LDS church, this idea that you can become God? And then second, is that changing today? We have to make sure we understand when you say becoming God, because a Latter-day Saint would never say that he or she is trying to become God. Okay. God is always going to be God. Now, I mean, the idea of did God have a God before him, there's not a whole lot written about that. And a lot of Latter-day Saints don't like to quote unquote speculate. But the idea of becoming divine, the idea of being able to... Uh, basically rule your own world in the same way because there's a little couplet and this is an important couplet is still being taught in the church today uh it's called the lorenzo snow couplet it says as man is god once was as god is man may be according to mormonism man may be as god as god uh, but but we today are as god once was we are human in the same way that god is human according okay. to uh doctrine and covenant section 130 verse 22 that god has a body of flesh and bones he had a previous life in a world we don't know much about but he worshiped a god and then if you want to go back in time that god had to do the same thing and he worshiped a god and it just goes on into an infinite regress william lane craig has done good work on the kalam yeah. cosmological argument right. which i think blows that whole idea away of having the possibility of an infinite regress it's not possible but so the idea that god though is the god of this realm of this world and that's whom they worship they don't worship jesus jesus they'll pray in jesus name but jesus is a god they believe that heavenly father elohim God the Father, all three of those are synonymous. They believe that God the Father became God, and uh, and so he created us in a spirit world. I'd mentioned before in the preexistence, then we were then brought to this estate called mortality. It's the second estate. The first estate would be preexistence. We obeyed Jesus. We accepted him as a savior. And so today, their hope is not to become God himself. Their hope is to progress and do what God did. And they think that, that they'll use uh, passages like the Imago Dei. They'll use Genesis that says that uh, God created man in his own image. Well, they take that very literally. A Latter-day Saint will say, see, God wants us to have what he has. We just have to be obedient enough to be able to reach that. So according to Mormonism, they hope to someday have their own realm. I, I don't like to use the word 
planet or worlds, but that's sure. really what it is that they will then be in charge of. That man will be able to have polygamous wives to be able to populate his world. He'll have to do the same thing that Heavenly Father did by having lots of children uh, um, that through all the different wives. It's a physical thing, too. It's actually there's relations between men and uh, between the man. There's only one one God. And then there's all these uh, wives and uh, and to be able to produce enough to be able to fill a, a world in the next life so that you will be the God as the man. The wife will will then uh, be uh, one of many, actually, to be able to uh, populate that world. So yes, they, that's a long way to answer, but they do believe that uh, godhood is available to them if they are fully obedient in this life. Now, is this proclaimed? Is it hidden? Does your typical Mormon on the streets know this? The impression that I get is that it's something that wouldn't be learned until somebody has deeply involved and committed in the church because if you say at the beginning it's clearly going to turn somebody away and give you at least with christian background and say wait a minute this is a different gospel so has it changed historically how much it's been proclaimed and taught and how much is it does your typical mormon today know this and live to accomplish that my friend bill mckeever likes to say he wishes that we could get back 70, 60, 70 years when we had some honest uh, Latter-day Saint leaders wow. out there who would tell you the way it was. Uh, 10th president, Joseph Fielding Smith, he was um, he was a president for a short time. He was an apostle for a long time, but he wrote three volumes called the Doctrines of Salvation. Those three volumes, if you read them, uh, I challenge a Latter-day Saint to read them. They'll be surprised, perhaps, some of the things that he says straightforward that maybe they they don't proclaim as well anymore. Another guy, Bruce McConkie. Bruce R. McConkie was an apostle of the church. He wrote a book called Mormon Doctrine. He got criticized a lot, but uh, the, the leaders, uh, when he passed away in the 1980s, they said this man who Mormon Mormonism better than anybody. So we've got we've got these people in the old days who would kind of tell you what it was. They would teach you from the pulpits. You don't have that as much anymore. It's uh, oftentimes, well, especially in the last few years, uh, I'm going to say the last 10 to 20 years, it's okay. just been more, more um, positive reinforcement, almost kind of like in some sense, uh, Joel Olstein, you know, you can do this and, you know, just, you know, you got to do better and and, uh, and trying to give hope to the people. But a theology is not very much uh, taught, nor I would I would agree with you on that, Sean. I don't think it's as well understood as maybe it used to be. But at the same time, if you quote the Lorenzo Snow couplet that I had said earlier, as yeah. man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. That was cited just in the last few years in church manuals, uh, uh, 2013 and 2012, uh, uh, two manuals that were they went through in uh, on Sunday mornings twice a month. Uh, th th that phrase was used, and, and it's very well taught. I think most Latter-day Saints would say, I agree with that. And so if, if they agree with the Lorenzo Snow couplet, that's much different than what Christianity teaches, obviously. And I think it's not hard for a Christian to be able to say, well, that's not the same God that I worship, because right. the God I worship is God from everlasting to everlasting. Psalm 90, verse 2. God doesn't change. Malachi 3, 6. John 4, 24 says that God is spirit. He must be worshipped in spirit and truth. There is so much in the Bible that helps us to understand who God is and who man is, and that we will always be uh, we will be, have glorified bodies, but we will never have a realm of our own that we will be worshipped someday. And I don't look for that. I don't think any Christian looks for that. But a Latter Day Saint, that that could very well be a, a motivation for them to want to be a Latter Day Saint. So the Gospel Topics essays on this either try to deflect it or give some biblical justification when Jesus said, "Ye are gods," and he clearly didn't mean the way that's taken. Uh, what has been the response? They obviously haven't said this was false and we reject that teaching. What is the response right now? Are they just releasing this and kind of hoping nobody asks? Where is the church at officially if you pressed them on this? Are you talking about the gospel topics essays as yeah, far as— Yeah, well, let's, let's start there with how they would respond to this. 
Well, I, I'm going to say the Gospel Topics essays were a godsend. I think it was for damage control because you're right. In 2010, a lot of things were happening. I think the Swedish rescue was a big problem. Uh, and then uh, Hans Matson, the guy from Sweden I was telling you about, he comes in 2011 to the United States and meets with Marlon Jensen, again, who was the uh, head of the history department. And then church leaders get involved, and they're finding out all of these people are leaving the church. There was a guy named John DeLynn who, along with a guy named Travis Stratford, those two guys put together surveys to show how many people were leaving the church. It caused a, a major, major problem. And so I'm, I'm going to say that um, uh, the, the essays then were a reaction to try to let's set the record straight. And so much of the essays are very accurate. The, um, they don't produce as much information as I would like. I, I would like them to have said more. But for the most part, they're coming to brass tacks, and, and, and so I commend them for wanting to do that. But like I said, it was a godsend because there were a lot of people in the last 15 years, the Internet's going big, websites like ours are out there for people to do research, and they're going, wait a minute, uh, you know, Joseph Smith is only married to, uh, to, to one woman, uh, Emma, and where do you get the idea that there were 30 or 40 wives? Well, now the church said it. Okay. So now we can take people to these essays and be able to uh, to say that this is what the church agrees with, that Joseph Smith did use uh, a rock and a hat. And uh, and so for a lot of Latter-day Saints, that, sh that shook them so badly. And here's the problem, wow. Sean. Here's okay. the problem. There was a book called The Next Mormons by Jana Reese. Uh, I read a Mormon, it. Uh, you've read that book. Yeah. And you— a lot of statistics. You're a statistic kind of guy. <laughs> what she said in there, what, what they came up with was, wow, close to half of all Latter-day Saints who leave the church go to atheism, agnosticism, or nothing at all, at all. 44%. That breaks my heart because what ends up happening now is people are leaving in droves. The last five to 10 years, we've seen them, especially since the Gospel Topics essays, people like that couple I was talking about, they head right over to nothing because there's a little saying in the church, Sean, that says, if the church is not true, then nothing, nothing else is. is. And what that means is, and they say that to themselves to kind of encourage one another, but what it means is, if we find this negative information and we ever were to leave the church, we have nowhere to go because gotcha. we know that Christianity can't be true because yep. of what's called the Great Apostasy, that soon after the death of the apostles, the different uh, councils that took place, uh, Council of Nicaea, Constantine, they'll throw those out, and they'll say there was a complete apostasy, and the restored church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the official name of the Mormon Church, and it's their leaders and their authority, their priesthood, uh, that, uh, and their temples okay. and everything else that allows a person to be able to uh, to hopefully head to the very best of the three kingdoms called the celestial kingdom. This is great stuff. Let's uh, let's shift to some of the DNA studies, which I think are fascinating and is about to me about as a physical determinative ways you can test the claims of Mormonism as anything. For those of you just joining us, we're here with Eric Johnson, the Mormonism Research Ministry, and we're talking about how the LDS Church has responded since the 2010s to the mass exodus of young people because of the historical, scientific, philosophical problems that have been discovered and disseminated through the internet. So what is it about the DNA uh, studies that pose a challenge for the historical record of the Book of Mormon? Well, you have to understand that the Book of Mormon story has a man named Lehi come over on a ship to the Americas, and uh, so he's Jewish, and all the you know all his uh, the people that came from him are Jewish people, Semitic, and so they come here, and then there are two people groups. Uh, there are the Lamanites and the Nephites. Laman was his son. Nephi was his son. They ended up having a disagreement. Lamanites became dark-skinned. The Nephites were the white-skinned people. They had battles back and forth. Long story short, but 421 A.D., uh, the Nephites were exterminated by the uh, by the Lamanites. They were completely destroyed. The last living uh, Nephite was Moroni, 
He's the angel on top of a okay. LDS temple. <clears throat> so the gold, you know, the gold statue there, yep. he's the one that buried the plates in a hill in, in at the Hill Camorra in New York that Joseph Smith later supposedly dug up and then translated those plates using this magic seer stone. So so the 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 Lamanites are the Native Americans. And so that's how it was always portrayed. Well, the problem is uh, there's no archaeology to help support this. There's uh, there's not a whole lot going on as far as support for this idea in North America. Many of the BYU scholars realized that, and so they focused then on, well, it can't be North America. It really wasn't the Hill Camorra there in New York, unless somehow Moroni made his way from Central America, because okay. you, have the, you have the Aztec and Mayan ruins, and so those would have been... Uh, the peoples, perhaps, that were the Lamanites. And so that's where they have to go because of the lack of support. But either way you go, whether you go with a limited geography uh, model or whether you come with what's called the Heartland model, like Glenn Beck, for instance, is a believer that it all happened here. Yeah. So there's disagreement within the LDS Church, and the LDS Church leaders don't tell you. You have to kind of figure this out for yourself. Well, um, DNA, and I remember when DNA just came out, and they were able to test people and see where they came from. Well, they ended up doing tests and uh, on Native Americans, and they were finding they did not have Semitic blood. They came from uh, the Bering Strait. They, they, uh, they were Asiatic uh, bloodlines. And so they did more and more and more. And so today the church realizes, okay, we don't really have any evidence because of all the people we've ever tested, uh, there's no, there's nothing there. And you have to understand, the Book of Mormon talks about millions of people scattered throughout the whole continent. Hmm. So it's not like it was just a limited area that they were at, that they would have, uh, you know, you have these Native Americans who are all over the place. That's how they got here. That was a popular theory when Joseph Smith put together the Book of Mormon in, the, uh, in 1830. That was already thought of by some, several other different writers. But uh, I, I come to this book that you mentioned, the LDS Gospel Topics series, written, it's, it's by signature book, so this is a quasi-LDS um, uh, uh, publisher, although they're very liberal, I would say, so they're not, they're not right. going to, this is not Deseret, but there was a chapter written, and, and it's an excellent chapter written by, um, and, I, and now I'm missing his name, um, I'll find it here real quick, DNA in the Book of Mormon, and... Um, and I'll get to the front of it, and it's by Thomas Murphy. Murphy. Thomas Murphy, uh, about 12 to 15 years ago, was interviewed by our mutual friend, Joel Kramer. Mm. Uh, Joel Kramer is an archaeologist. He yep. lives in Jordan today, but he does a lot of work in, uh, in Israel. He's done a lot of archaeology. He's a friend of mine. Whenever I take people to Israel, I always make sure that I have Joel with me, and he takes us to archaeological places that people wouldn't normally go to. But in a video that he did called DNA and the Book of Mormon, I would encourage it's your— It's fascinating. Uh, uh, DNA and the Book of Mormon, he interviews Thomas Murphy. When this whole thing started, back, I, don't know, I don't know what year that video was, maybe 2005. And uh, Murphy is a scientist. He was from Washington State. He's not a Christian. He's, I, I think he's an atheist or an agnostic at best. Okay. But, um, but he basically has railed against the church for claiming that any of the people who were here in the Americas uh, had anything to do with the Book of Mormon people. Well, this is a problem, Sean, because if the Book of Mormon is not a historical book, and a lot of Latter-day Saints have moved that way, they are basically saying, well, it works for me. And so as long as it works for me, uh, it can be a spiritual book. But that's not the freedom given by the church leaders. It's not a freedom that was given by Joseph Smith himself. It's either, uh, in fact, uh, one leader said, if the Book of Mormon is not true, then we're caught in a false lie. And he's exactly right. That's powerful. The book, but the Book of Mormon is crucial. And why do they spend so much time encouraging people to read the Book of Mormon? You don't hear the leaders talking about reading the Bible all the way through, but they encourage them to read the Book of Mormon. And yet, if it's not a historical book and it's just a good feel book that you know I can learn um, how to feel better— uh, then I don't think it's, I'm going to say the Book of Mormon is as important to the Latter-day Saint as the resurrection is. The resurrection is. is. First Corinthians 15, Paul says, if anybody does, uh, if, if, 
if this uh, resurrection is not true, we're the most pitied of all people. Wow. He, he says, here's what, here's your evidence. And he goes through 500 witnesses. And he goes does, through all of yeah. that in the first few verses. And then he builds mm. a case for the resurrection of the body. But he does say, if we're, not, if we're wrong on this, then this is just a fairy tale. And maybe the atheist is right. It's just a, it's a way that we feel good about ourselves, thinking we're going to go to heaven if it's all imaginary. Um, it's no better than the flying spaghetti monster of Dawkins. I, th- I mean, I really, think that's I mean, right. it's, it's no good. And, and so I would say if the Book of Mormon is not true, as well as the first vision you had brought out earlier. Well, we'll co- let's it, come back to that. Yeah, and what, yeah what those comment? two you, things are historical cornerstones so of this So you raised church. this book, the LDS Gospel Topic Series, that neither of us wrote. It's uh, written by a bunch of scholars and historians. If mm-hmm. people want to see the response— from there's some Christian scholars, some Mormon scholars, and others about these essays. It's a fascinating volume. And in the one on here, uh, the scientist who's writing this, he says, some people might say, well, the population was so small and you couldn't detect the DNA this far removed. But he says, and here he goes, first off, the population of the Book of Mormon was massive. And second, we have DNA studies of small groups that have been preserved through a long time removed. So it doesn't seem to me that that's going to get them out of the problem. What's your thoughts? Oh, you, I think you stated it very well. And I think that, um, I think a lot of Latter-day Saints realize that you're not going to be able to point to uh, DNA. You're not going to be able to point to the Native Americans, which is how it was taught for years and years. There was one LDS teacher, Ezra Tapp Benson, who talked about, they've always had, the LDS Church has always had a special affinity for uh, the Native Americans, or they used to call them the Indians. And and, uh, and so they would adopt these reservations and they try to convert them to Mormonism. And Ezra Tapp Benson one time said uh, that it's amazing that what's happening to these people when they become Mormons, their skin starts to become whiter. Yeah. Because there, there's a verse in the Book of Mormon. That bef- it was changed in 1981. Well, but wait, the, the, hold on yeah. before we – we're yeah. going to come back to this race thing. Hold wh- All one right. piece at a time. You know exactly I, where I want to I I yeah. go with this. I'm glad you, you're chomping at the bits. I um, am. Let me read one, and then let's actually move to that topic. This is in okay. the Gospel Topics article by Thomas Murphy, who you cited. He says yeah. ra- about the Gospel Topics essay from the LDS Church – attempting to address DNA studies. And he says, rather than offering a truth-telling confession, the LDS Church's Gospel Topics essay on Book of Mormon and DNA studies minimizes the significance of findings from DNA by using a primer on population genetics to divert attention away from a lack of evidence and to give the impression that everything is okay. Those are damning words. I, I think he's, yeah. Do you, yeah. First off, do you agree with that? And is that true on a lot of these issues in the Gospel Topics essays? I think I, th- I think it is. I think what he is saying is absolutely uh, correct. And he, he deals with this kind of issue as far as – I'm not a DNA scientist at all, but – I think the purpose of putting together the Gospel Topics essays was to offer some kind of response to the really tough issues we're talking about here, and then to be able to say, we responded to that. But let me tell you, you, today you can Google it, but five years ago you you could not Google Gospel Topics essays and find anything on the church website. They did not promote it. It took three clicks. You did. You had to know where you were going to go to be able to get to where these essays are even located. So today you can actually do that because Google has worked it out so that they're the number one site when you type in those three words. But when you read these, you're not getting all the information. You're getting some things of trying to explain, you know, oh, yeah, well, and and, and – I don't think the people who wrote that are very good at the science compared to somebody like a Thomas Murphy. So when he comes in and says that, that is damning right. because because what uh, what he's saying is you're blowing smoke when you're saying, well, too small of a sample or it was a limited area. Those are common responses, but that's not how your book reads. And if we're going to take it literally, then we should be able to find some DNA somewhere. And we haven't we haven't found any. Uh, Semitic blood anywhere in any of the testing that they've done. Let's shift to the racial issue, but I want to make one distinction for our viewers is that if you're not a believer, you might be watching going, well, there's problems with the evangelical church. What about evidence for the Exodus? What about the historical Adam? 
Well, one difference is there's scholars like Stephen Myers, Meyer writing a book on the Exodus and going to publish it soon and engage the ideas. Josh Swamanas, William Lane Craig, writing books on the historical Adam, defending these things publicly, admitting that there's some tough questions for Christianity, not hiding them, but willing to engage the evidence, not hide them. The way we see these gospel topic series released on a Friday before the weekend, embedded in the website, there's a very significant difference there I think people need to pick up on. Now let's shift to the one you were bringing in before. Obviously in the past six to eight months, there's been a lot of talk uh, about racial issues in, in the U.S. And as I understand from reading the Book of Mormon and some of the history, there's a whiteness theology that has been embedded since the beginning of the LDS church and still exists today. So would you be willing to just talk about where do we see this? This isn't a secondary issue, but I believe Joseph Fielding Smith, people like Bruce McConkie, Pearl of Great Price, Book of Mormon, teach that black skin is a curse and have proclaimed that even the Native Americans, as their skin gets white, this is a blessing from the Lord. So first off, did I represent that accurately? And I want to know, how is the church responding to this? Well, this is a tough issue because if you go back to the early leaders, um, just like polygamy the same way, they taught very much the uh, what, what lasted for many years in the Mormon church that, that um, uh, well, I'm going to give you one quote just to help you. Brigham Young, second president of the church. We've all heard of Brigham Young. He says this in 1863. Shall I tell you the law of God? in regard to the African race, if the white man who belonged to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, which are the black people, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. And so what Brigham Young is saying, and I, that's just one of a number of quotes I could show, that they believe that the blacks were cursed with the black skin because of their unfaithfulness in the pre-existence, you have to understand, they were kind of, they weren't as good as the white people that got to be born into white families. And so if you kind of were maybe headed over toward Lucifer and you kind of straddled the line there, then you might have been sent to a black home. That's how they taught it. Uh, and so uh, there was uh, second class citizenship within Mormonism. You could not receive the priesthood as a black man. Uh, if you had one drop of black blood, according to Brigham Young, you were disqualified because that meant you had sinned in the previous life. It's kind of like this karma, you know, reincarnation that uh, it's kind of it's kind of Hinduism in a sense, because what you did in a previous life affects you in this life. It wasn't until they made it through the civil rights continuing on not allowing blacks to get married uh, for time and eternity to their wives. Uh, they can only do it for time, not for eternity, until 1978. June of 1978, uh, the 12th president of the church, Spencer Kimball, uh, came with a revelation, just like they had in 1890 to allow, uh, to, to get rid of polygamy. In 1978, God supposedly and, and, and put it on his mind that blacks should now be allowed to hold the priesthood. I think they had known that for a few years because in 1975, they had commissioned a temple to be built in Brazil. Well, if you know anything about the yeah. history of Brazil, everybody has one drop of black blood in them. And so who was going to be able to use this temple? That temple opens a few months later. And so I think that's quite interesting. But uh, I think I think Spencer Kimball always wanted to do that. But you had some hard hardliners. You had 10th President uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, who didn't think that. 11th President Harold B. Lee. But Harold B. Lee dies in 1973. Uh, now the head guy is Spencer Kimball. And I think he always kind of wanted to uh, to allow for that. And I think some of the other leaders did, too. So since 1978, blacks have the same privileges as whites. But uh, but that still is not forgotten here in Utah. When we were having we did have riots here in Salt Lake City. We had mm. some major things that took place a whole day of uh, of, uh, of destruction wow. in, in downtown. But um, what what people were doing was going on to BYU's campus and putting red paint on Brigham Young and desecrating some of the statues there because oh of what, what he had taught. So there's a lot of. Uh, they've never apologized for that. They they don't apologize. The leaders don't. And so they have um, – uh, now they're trying to do their best. They're not into Black Lives Matter per se, but they sure. seem to want to identify 
with uh, with those who are of black skin and say we love you and we think you're God's children but they didn't always think that and those critics that point back to the time before 1978 where their grandparents or maybe even their parents were not allowed to get married in the temple uh, that is not for easily forgotten by people so it seems to me they only have so many options because it's so deeply embedded not only in former presidents but in the scriptures so theologically yep. there's been a shift as far as I understand it in some of the recent uh, additions of the, of the Book of Mormon where the passage white and delightsome is pure and delightsome there's been an adjustment in that regard but it seems like it can only go so far and either they bury it down or admit that the scriptures are wrong which would undermine the basis of the faith I mean what other options do they have here yeah I, I and that's and that's uh, a verse that um, was changed in 1981 uh, from okay. in 1981 they actually they made the change uh, uh, it originally was um, white and delightsome it was changed to pure and delightsome there was a number of changes that have taken place in the in the uh, Book of Mormon but that's how they rationalized it but I'm gonna tell you I mentioned earlier and I jumped the gun when I was talking about um, uh, Spencer Kimball on an Indian reservation, he used that verse in Nephi, and I, I, I'm trying to remember the exact verse, so I can't find it here, but um, he used that verse to say the Indians who were becoming Latter-day Saints, their skin was becoming whiter. Yeah. He was using that verse. So that verse has been used throughout the years as one that white skin was more desired than dark skin. Mm -hmm. And then you come to 1978, and they realized okay well we got this verse that was used this way let's change it so they changed it to pure and delightsome and so today okay. many latter-day saints if they've never seen a a, a pre-1981 edition of the book of mormon wouldn't even know that unless they saw it on the internet i think the issues are deep i have this again for those of us watching we have the lds gospel topic series scholars reflecting on the gospel topics essays some skeptics some christians some mormon writers as far as i understand and again, the Book of Mormon recounts a story of the, the Lamanites whom God cursed with dark skin for their wickedness. This is in the right. Book of Mormon it's talked about. Gives other examples. The Pearl of Great P Price posits a link between moral purity and skin color. That'd be uh, the Book of Abraham. Yeah. And specifically the Book of Abraham, which we're going to come to. You have Spencer Kimball who taught that Indians left the reservation after converting to Mormonism. They became as light as Anglos. Joseph yeah. Fielding Smith, we know of cases where the dark skin of Negroes really has disappeared. I mean, it's deeply embedded. So I don't know what options the Mormon Church has because clearly the leadership today, I don't know them personally, but I'm sure they're not racist, but they also are committed to these beliefs. And I don't know how you get out of this trouble. So, well, let, let's keep going. Let's ask one of the huge issues that comes up is the plural wives of Joseph Smith. And you mentioned earlier that oftentimes when women discover this, uh, this is what drives them away. So first off, just in terms of the historical record, what can we say with confidence about the number of wives Joseph Smith had and who they were? And then let's come to how the LDS church has responded to this. Well, uh, they've come clean, I, I have to say. They, now, they haven't gone into all the detail, but for a lot of Latter-day Saints, they did not know. I'll give you an example. In, in uh, 2007, at, at the Mormon Miracle Pageant in Manti, Utah, uh, this was an annual pageant. They just stopped it this past year, and yeah. but it had been going on for over 50 years. But in 2007, we go out to the streets and share our faith. We're witnessing to people. And one year, we decided to try something. So we got together 33 women. That's the number that... Uh, uh, that many of the historians say the LDS Church has said between 30 and 40. Actually, they're being quite generous there. I don't. I wouldn't. I don't know how you count 40. But 33 women. We got girls as young as 14, and they had a little uh, a thing around their neck that told everybody who they were. They were dressed in prairie dresses, and we marched out there. It caused a big stir, oh and people goodness. were coming up, and they were pointing their fingers and saying, "Joseph Smith was married to Emma." You guys, this is anti-Mormon lies. I, I can't tell you how many people uh, said that in 2007, uh, before this information was readily available. Uh, we, I had to debate people. I had to show them records, and they said, no, you're just showing us false lies. 
We did the same thing, Sean, in 2017. Same exact presentation. Ten years later, we wanted to see how it would go. Do you know how many people argued against the 33 wives? Not one. I, we were Not there for two one? Friday nights. Not one person came up. And I'm going to wow. say dozens of people were upset with us. Not Well, they were upset with us in 2017 because they it's embarrassing for them to sure. have these 14-year-old sure. girls. And they're the wives. My and the goodness. girls, you know, these we would show them the history so they could talk as if they were the wives. So people could come up and actually engage with, uh, with uh, Emily Partridge. There were... Uh, Joseph Smith married sisters, so there were two. There were uh, there were uh, four different wives who were sisters. Again, women who were as young as 14. That doesn't sound normal when a guy who's in his mid 30s is courting these girls. And sexual relations was a part of this. It's very clear historically, except maybe for a few of the wives. For the most part, the Mormon historians have agreed that there were sexual relations. Well, wait a minute. What's the purpose of it? Well, if you go to Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, and Jacob, chapter 2, in the Book of Mormon, those two passages both say the only possible reason you would want polygamy is to raise up seed, so you can have children. Well, okay. if that's the case, why does Joseph Smith marry 11 women who were already married to living husbands? That... That bothers Ouch. women, especially when they go, Ouch. are you kidding me? But I'm going to say that's accurate because according to Mormonism, that uh, there will be multiple wives in the next life. And I'll prove it to you because the top two leaders of the church, Russell M. Nelson and Dallin H. Oaks, Russell M. Nelson is the 17th president. Dallin H. Oaks is the first counselor of the first presidency. Those are the top two leaders of the church. They both been married twice for time and eternity. Both of them had their wives die. Interesting. And then they married women who had never been married in the temple before. They married them, and they got married for eternity. Both of those men expect to see both of their wives in the next life, and that's just a start. There will be many other wives added in. So even though polygamy is not practiced here, it officially stopped in 1890, although they continued until 1904. Uh, and, and so... A lot of people mistakenly say, oh, Mormons are polygamists. Well, they're not polygamists now, but they still are polygamists when it comes to eternity, and the proof is showing you the top two leaders. So polygamy is, uh, um, I, I think, uh, a historical uh, big-time problem, but they've admitted to it in the essays. Again, I give them credit for doing that. Now, obviously, when you look in the Old Testament, polygamy is an issue too. David, Solomon, Jacob possibly Moses. He had two wives. We don't know if they're at the same time or not. So in your mind, how does this count against Mormonism, given that God uses in the Old Testament some very fallen prophets? If you look at the biblical history, God never commands anybody to get married to a second wife or multiple wives. That's number one. Number two, we never see anything good come out of polygamy. That's Not true. once. I mean, take a look at uh, uh, Solomon. Solomon's kingdom gets split. He had 300 wives, 700 concubines. He had all these women. And the, it says, the Bible says, they led him away and uh, from the Lord and the relationship that he had. And so the kingdom gets split in two with his sons. So I would say... God allowed for it. He allows for other things. I, I think he allows for divorce, but he hates it, according right. to Malachi. Right. Uh, he hates divorce, and yet God can still work through a bad situation. And, and I, I look at Abraham. Think about, you know, he's married to Sarah, and they both had doubts. And so Sarah is the one that says, hey, marry my handmaid servant, marry Hagar. And he does. And she ends up having Ishmael. She does. And, uh, and then after she gets pregnant, she says, get rid of her. So he has to cast her out. Well, today, Ishmael is the, I mean, they, the Muslim people look to Abraham as being their father. And Ishmael is the way that the race continued, not through Isaac. And I think that you, you have a major problem when it comes to, uh, to the polygamy of Abraham, because look at the enemy of Israel today. You know, it's interesting. We could make one more distinction that Abraham didn't have the scriptures. Solomon and David at most had the the Pentateuch. But we now have the entire Old Testament, the teachings of Jesus. And Joseph Smith came 1,800 years after that, should have known different, and is held to a very different account than the Old Testament patriarchs, given that there's a progressive revelation. I think a case could be made there. 
uh, as well. Let's shift to one more topic that is huge, and then we want to take some, some people have been lining up questions. I, I apologize. Normally, I like to come to these questions throughout, but I want to make sure we cover some of these uh, with with Eric. To me, one of the most troubling issues for the historical claim of the Book of Mormon is the Book of Abraham. And I think along with DNA studies, this is about as close as you can get to showing that the claims of the Mormon scriptures are just blatantly false. And Joseph Smith was a false prophet. Now, talk briefly, just in case those aren't familiar that it's a part of the Pearl of Great Price, a part of the larger Mormon scriptures, explain briefly what it is and how recent findings after the time of Joseph Smith called into doubt its veracity. There was a traveling salesman in 1835 who was going through Kirtland, Ohio. He had some mummies from uh, from Egypt, and he ends up he ends up selling those mummies along with some papyrus. And so Joseph Smith said, "This is from Abraham." They actually paid a lot of money. They paid several thousand dollars, and a lot of money in those days. And then he ends up translating those. And today is those uh, the information is found in the Book of Abraham and the Pearl of Great Price, one of the four scriptures. Uh, it uh, the actual papyrus was lost. Emma had it. She sold it. Uh, a lot of people thought it was in the Chicago fire. Uh, Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over the lantern and burned yeah. that. And, uh, and so for years, that's what everybody thought. But then in the mid-1960s, a professor from the University of Utah was looking through the Metropolitan Museum's archives and found these scrolls. He ends up contacting the LDS Church. And so uh, there was a guy named Hugh Nibley, who was a scholar. Uh, he and some others Actually, they ended up taking possession. The Metropolitan Museum gave them the uh, the papyrus. Well, back in 1835, uh, there was really no information in the United States about what Egyptology was about, the hieroglyphics. Uh, uh, we, we do have with, with um, uh, in 1799, we have the uh, Rosetta Stone that was discovered. But it took years in Europe to break the code of what the hieroglyphics would be. Sure. And so he could say, these mean anything, and, and he could get away with it. Well, then they did the study, and they determined that, wait a minute, it has nothing to do with what he said. So one of the nice things, Sean, about the Gospel Topics essays, the church has come clean. They say okay. it's not a literal translation like we thought it was. Wow. It was a spiritual translation. So basically, now they also say, well, we may not have all of it. And I'm telling you, Egyptologists would disagree with everything they've ever said about that. But at the very best, they say, well, it could be a spiritual interpretation. If Joseph Smith is able to make a spiritual translation out of something that that's not what the original author was saying, then... I mean, how do we know anything he did with the Book of Mormon? Because we don't have those originals. Mm -hmm. The angel supposedly took the gold place back. How do we know any of that is accurate? This is a major problem, and it is the number one reason why people leave Mormonism. The Book of no, Abraham, number by far. Number one reason, really? Number one reason when it comes to theological issues. I'm not talking about they're okay. leaving because they're homosexual or you know they don't like the church's stance on that or whatever else. But theologically— this is, uh, and it's like maybe number five or six, uh, if you look at the book by, uh, by Reese, I think it was, it was down a little bit, but, but if, for, if you're talking about a reason to leave the church, the Gospel Topics essays, this is number one. Eric, when I was, I brought a group of students out, it was probably eight or ten years ago, Brett Kunkel was with us from Maven, we stayed at your house with like 40 students and just overrid your house with a ton yeah, of students. Yeah, fun. You were a gracious host. We went to BYU just to have conversations and meet with students. And Brett and I went to uh, farms to talk with some of their apologists. And we met with one of the leading Book of Abraham scholars in the world. And he's mentioned in this book. I won't mention his name. not going to call him out. He's written a book on it. And we sat there for an hour. And he was gracious with his time essentially at the end of it, what his move was when we just said, can you give us a LDS response to this? He basically made this postmodern move and said, well, what does language mean? What can we know? What is, and I was, I walked out there and I was stunned and I thought, this is their best apologist. Now a right. lay person could hear him and probably if they're looking for an explanation, be satisfied emotionally. But that was not satisfying for me. I walked away and was like, this is confirming even greater that this is a fraud. Have you heard that explanation? What other explanations are there out there 
besides it was spiritually transformed or we just have this postmodern language? Are there any that are at least plausible to give the benefit of the doubt? I think uh, I think this book points out, and I, I think um, the the critics have very well said there's that they don't have a whole lot to go with. I know some have said, well, it's not all there, but um, uh, if, if there's a there's a video that people ought to watch if they're that interested in the lost or the the book of Abraham. It's called the Lost Book of Abraham. It's on it's YouTube. Great. It's, it's great. an hour long. Watch that video, and you'll see this Egyptologist I'm talking about, Robert, and I can't remember his last name, Robert Rice, or uh, wh whatever his last name was. He he uh, uh, he basically said, "No way, absolutely, that uh, it's it's all it's maybe one percent is gone, but not enough to be able to say that uh, the, that it was something that they haven't found." So that was very very damning in the mid 1960s. Yeah. Before the 1960s, they get away with it. But now they can't. And I, I, I said, I mentioned earlier, the Black Doctrine came from the Book of Abraham. If it's not a true book, then these guys are quoting out of it, and it's not even uh, something that is accurate because it's not historical. It's made up. Hmm. Eric, this is really great stuff. I, there's some excellent questions here I want to ask, and I also want to respect your time, but I'm going to keep you, if you don't mind, for a handful more I'm questions. Fine. I, I can stay. Yeah. This came from uh, Ryan Pauly. By the way, if you're listening, if you don't know Ryan Pauly, subscribe to his YouTube channel. Wonderful apologetics. Uh, went through our Biola apologetics program as a high school teacher. And I'm going to pull this question over. He says this. He says, how would Eric respond to the LDS argument that in Joseph Smith History 134, where Moroni said the plates were gold plates, he was only referring to the color, not the material. And I would answer that if you ask the latter day, and this is why I always like to bring it up myself when we're talking about the gold plates, I say, what were they made of? And, uh, and they will say gold. The metal gold, yes. Most Latter-day Saints automatically. It's only when you try to get away from the weight of the plates because the plates were uh, called six by eight by six. It was a stack of okay. gold plates. Gold weighs 1,200 pounds per cubic foot. Six by eight by six would be a six of a cubic foot. 200 pounds. My friend Bill McKeever likes to go out on the street with his steel yeah. plates, as, uh, and uh, they're 80 pounds. And he has people trying to lift them up, and they go, whoa, these are heavy. And they are, uh, but uh, they're not even half of what these gold plates were. But supposedly Joseph Smith put them under his arm and ran with them three miles, uh, a beating off attackers. It's just an unfathomable story. And so, yes, uh, in fact, in one issue of the Ensign magazine about five years ago, they did a special edition of the Book of Mormon. And throughout it, I noticed they used golden, golden, golden. They, they were talking about the color. Okay. I noticed in recent, uh, the last few years, they don't use golden. They call it gold whenever they're talking about the plates. So I, I would just, I would throw, and then if they're, if they're any kind of material, I mean, what do you, do they have aluminum? Can you write on aluminum? I mean, even if at the very least, they're going to be at least 40 pounds, but you have to play with that in order to, to, uh, to manipulate the, the weight to be something reasonable that Joseph Smith could have carried. It's a minor issue, but it's just one piece of evidence. Yeah. Like what we're talking about with the Bible. Why do we believe the Bible? Here's one reason. That's not the only reason, but it's just one of many. Or why do we believe in God? We come up with a whole list of evidences. I'm going to say with the with the Book of, uh, uh, of Mormon, uh, this is just one more strike against its historicity. It's a strong cumulative case. That was a great answer. Let's go to a consistent viewer, Susan, who goes by Slam RM. Uh, says, how do Mormons uh, respond to the fact of long passages of the Book of Mormon taken from the 1769 KJV, including the translation errors that are present? And that actually gets dealt with in this book that we've been talking about. They, they actually refer to that. Yes, the 1769 is the version that's used, but he actually puts in italics from the 1611 edition, you know, oh. which is the original King James Version. He actually includes italics. This is a problem because Joseph Smith is supposedly translating into English letter by letter. God is showing him in this hat the letters, and supposedly he's not allowed to continue until he gets it right. And yet we have complete, uh, we have anachronisms. We have things in there that were not uh, part of the New World, uh, that were not part of that history that came much later. Uh, we do have uh, exact quotations out of the King James Version of the Bible. 
I mean, let's just be honest. There's no way that God told him to speak in the King James English because they weren't right. speaking in that. Well, obviously, they made a uh, retranslation in 1769 uh, from the 1611. Uh, but uh, the, all the yees and the these and everything else, they got transposed right into or tra- brought right over into right. the uh, uh, into the uh, Book of Mormon. What's interesting, and they bring this out in the book, in the, that one chapter, is that there are sections where the Book of Mormon is taken directly from the King James Version. Well, then in 1833, Joseph Smith retranslates the Bible. It's called the Joseph Smith Translation. Oh, that's right. And he changed a number of the things that were found in the Book of Mormon exactly the way it was in the 1769, and he says that was a false translation, and here's the way it should be. How could God do that with his version in 1835 of the Bible and not five years earlier had the same exact version that would have gone into his Book of Mormon? It makes no sense. That's that's a that's a great answer. I've got I've got two more for you. And by the way, as I read, I sat down and read all of the Mormon scriptures. It's been a few years. I remember a few things stood out to me just from kind of studying it one time. It was that the Book of Mormon quotes the last 12 verses of Mark as if it's canonical when most scholars recognize it's not. That hit me like, okay, wait a second. I remember reading the Sermon on the Mount thinking, why would Jesus give the same message, the Sermon on the Mount, which makes sense in a certain Greco-Roman cultural milieu in America with an entire different background? Like if you just read it critically— there's so many problems with it that struck me. Here's a, here's a couple for you. Um, here's one from Troy Hinkle. This is helpful. He's a regular viewer that I appreciate. Says, can you explain the s- different standard we use for making scripture canon versus LDS? What tests have to be passed to be considered scripture? Well, in Mormonism, they do have the four written standard works, they call them, uh, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. Now, it's a great question because they believe that there's not a closed canon. They do believe in an open canon, but they have not added to that canon for about 100 years. The last time was a revelation that was given to Joseph F. Smith that was added into the Doctrine and Covenants. Most of what's found in the Doctrine and Covenants, about 138 chapters, or they're called sections, 138 of those mostly come from Joseph Smith. Supposedly, the prophet, if he thought that God was giving him something new, would be able to put it in the Scripture. But whenever they've come out with something new, like, for instance, a few years ago, they came out with what's called the Proclamation of the Family. They never said it was Scripture, so it's not found in the standard works. But they also believe what their leaders teach is considered to be scripture. And so when they speak at general conference, for instance, those are two special sessions every year. What it, I can show you lots of quotes where it says that what they say is to be considered scripture. It's supposed to be followed. It's as if the word of the Lord said. They don't have to say, thus saith the Lord. It's as if he has said that. So they do believe in the open canon. Uh, they accept the same 66 books as we do. They don't accept the Apocrypha. Uh, but then they do have a caveat with the Bible. The Bible is true as far as it is translated correctly, Joseph Smith said. That's found in what's called the Articles of Faith, Eighth Article of Faith. And so that, uh, I, I would say to the Christian, use your Bible as much as possible. And then if somebody says, well, I don't know if that's translated correctly, then say, Okay, well, let's go to the Joseph Smith translation because uh, okay. the Joseph Smith translation supposedly fixed all of those things, and he finished it according to uh, their own sources. So, so uh, I, you know, you can you can say the Bible is not completely accurately true, but again, the Bible is not the most important thing to a Latter Day Saint. It's more the Book of Mormon, and uh, and yet the Book of Mormon does not teach hmm. Mormonism today. Uh, they, they, there's a lot of things that are left out there that Mormonism teaches today. They don't teach that God was once a man. They don't teach that temples are necessary. They uh, they don't believe that you can do work on this life in order to, because uh, they do work for the dead in their temples. They, right. they do genealogy so that they can actually get baptized on their behalf because they need to have a physical body. So they do it vicariously. Uh, Alma chapter 34 in the Book of uh, Mormon, verses 32 and following. Read that, and you'll see very clearly the Book of Mormon teaches against that kind of a thing. So um, so they, they do have their scripture, but then it's kind of a postmodern way of going about things. It's, well, what is it that I want to believe? 
And so you do have a lot of Latter-day Saints walking around, maybe not even believing exactly what their leaders say, but it's sure. a very pragmatic faith. They prayed about it. They know it's true. And then they can go in a lot of different directions where the Christian has the Bible as a standard, and that's our compass. Uh, a lot of Latter-day Saints, they really, theology is not a big thing with them. And so they go in many different ways because they, uh, they don't have that same standard we do, although officially they do. I've got one more question for you that comes from Teresa. This is a great question, but uh, those of you just uh, joining us or you've been hanging in with us, I'm with Eric Johnson from the Mormonism Research Ministry, which is my go-to ministry. I send people to your podcast, Eric. You have videos there, articles. I'll just show one more time. You and I compiled a book together called Sharing the Good News with Mormons. And it was neat because in that book, we brought together a bunch of different people who have practical ministry to Mormons different models and somebody's not going to do all of them but given your comfort zone and opportunities very practical ways to engage people in the lds church so i know you give all your proceeds from this to the mormon research ministry so i would encourage people to pick it up it was fun to work on that uh with you here's the last question uh this is from Teresa. very thoughtful question it says uh why do the scriptures like first second third nephi ether, ether etc all say jesus is god and the only way to be saved if they aren't true? Well, it, it, you know, um, if you want to be quite honest, uh, the Book of Mormon is more Trinitarian. Uh, it's not really Trinitarian, but it's more, much more Trinitarian than it would be uh, what Mormonism teaches. Uh, Mormonism teaches in tritheism, uh, that the Father is a God that we are to worship. He's the God of this world. The Son, it, Jesus, is the Son of God, literally. And uh, and he, he he's not to be prayed to, but he is God. And then a third God would be the Holy Ghost, although there's disagreements as to what exactly that means and what do we do with the Holy Ghost. Um, uh, you know, when you when you read the Book of Mormon, a lot of changes have been made. I encourage you go online and you can read the 1830 edition that was originally written, and you will be surprised at some of the things. They don't have it all in verses and chapters like we have today, but you can go through that and you'll go, oh my goodness, look at this. The changes that were made to take away the idea that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one God. Uh, they added in, uh, when it's talking about Jesus, they would add in the Son of God, because it calls him God in the original 1830. Wait a minute, Joseph Smith supposedly received this by revelation, word for word. Mm. Why do we have to make these changes? And you're making these changes without the autograph. You don't have the original to be able to go back and say, wow, you know, this is what the autograph said. They made a mistake. The, the printer did it or whatever else. We don't have that because quite conveniently, the Book of Mormon manuscript was taken. So all you're left with is the copy that Joseph Smith supposedly penned, and I find that to be quite problematic because uh, if the Book of Mormon is supposed to be this ancient scripture, we shouldn't have to be changing things if we have the original to be able to move it into the English language and to be able to say it is God's word for us today. So, you know, just because... Um, you know, a Latter-day Saint doesn't understand these things. I don't know how many Latter-day Saints really look closely at the words that they're reading, because as you read the Book of Mormon, Sean, you realize it's very hard to read. It's very confusing, it full is. of King James anachronisms. Uh, wow. And, and so I always encourage, if, if there's any Latter-day Saints who are listening, I say, you know what? Give the Bible a chance. I'd say try to move away from the King James read a modern version, read an English Standard Version or an NIV, good. or there's a good translations. I'm going to tell you, M Micah Wilder is coming out with a book this summer. Great. Micah Wilder is the head of um, uh, Adams Road Ministry. They, yeah. They're a band that goes around, and he was a missionary. Uh, many of people here may be familiar with Lynn Wilder, his mom, who was a professor at BYU, but he became a Christian as a missionary, when a Christian pastor he was trying to convert told him, read the Bible as a little child. Micah wow. read the New Testament. I think he said he read it 80 times. I don't know if that's exact, but oh somewhere in there. He, during this two years, and he ends up getting kicked off a week before he was supposed to be done because they, he got up. At this supposed to be an honor to go and speak to all the other guys, and he talked about having a relationship with Jesus, and he talked about all the things that he learned about reading the New Testament. He talked about Romans, and he wrote, talked about Ephesians, and all of this, and it's about having this relationship with Jesus, and, um, and so the church, uh, after it was over, the, the leader said, 
uh, you know, you're not supposed to talk like that. You sound like an evangelical. He says, I don't know what an evangelical is, but, <laughs> but he says, uh, you know, I'm just doing what the Bible says. Wow. And so based on a story like that, read the Bible in a version that you can understand. Start with the book of John. Look at the book of Romans Rated and nice. ask yourself if what you're reading coincides with what the Mormon church has taught and is teaching. And I don't care about, you know, all the things that they're trying to do to fix their history, the gospel topics essays. Again, I, I commend them for trying to come out and be open. I think the collateral damage they thought would take place is much greater than they ever anticipated. Wow. If wow. they had known all the people were going to leave like this, not all, but many people have left, maybe they wouldn't have done it. Maybe they'd have tried something else, but they wanted to say, we responded to that and uh, whatever those issues were we've talked about it during the past hour and um, i want to continue to bring forth the gospel topics essays i want to show that there are problems with mormonism but just because there's problems with mormonism doesn't mean you have to throw away the baby with the bathwater. there is a god there is a jesus and he wants a relationship with people mm. and i believe the bible is god's revealed word i'm writing a book right now called introducing Christianity to Mormons, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to show Mormons using their language so they'll understand the differences, but I want to show the story of Christianity. And when you, as you have done, Sean, you've done so well with so many books. Um, I mean, the one that you've done with your dad on on, uh, on, uh, on the evidence book, wow, I mean, all the, the things that we have, the evidence, head toward where the evidence goes. And if the evidence says Mormonism is not true and people are leaving there, then head toward what is true. And I think there's a lot to be said for the Christian case compared to atheism or agnosticism or nothing at all. So that's, that would that's be my great. plea for people. I love that. Thanks for sharing that, Eric. Do me a favor. When your book is coming out, let me know. We'll do an interview. We'll help spread the word. Uh, let Micah know that uh, – give him my contact information. Maybe we could have will. him on and talk about his story. It's such a fascinating story in his experience. Maybe him and his mom together. I, I don't know if they would come on, but ask them, and that would be an absolutely fascinating show. Now, just very quickly, um, tell listeners what they'll find or viewers if they go to mrm.org, which again is my go-to site I suggest. Christian go-to for resource and even – Mormons who've talked to me say, you know, how do I see the other side? MRM.org, just really quickly, what will people find when they go there? Our middle name is research. And so what it is involving a lot of research, a lot of articles, a lot of uh, uh, videos. We have a daily podcast. In fact, next month we'll be doing number 2,500. We've wow. been doing over the past decade. Yeah, 2,500. <laughs> and so we're excited about that. We have a lot of people who listen to us, including Latter-day Saints. People have come out of Mormonism listening to our podcast. Amazing. You can listen to, we have an index of all of the old shows that we've done. It's a 15 minute show. So it's really in and out fast. We do have, um, uh, we have a, a, a column that is done a, about twice a month by Sharon Lindblom. On, it's called uh, News in, Mormonism in the News is what it's called. So she's okay. dealing with current issues. So we have a lot of things there that are available for somebody who wants to get that research, who wants to learn more how to evangelize. Uh, we have books that we have written as well. Uh, Bill and I have uh, co-authored a number of books. So, yeah, I encourage people, mrm.org. That We got that three-letter URL back in 1995 when there were still three-letter URLs That's available. Amazing. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we have been doing this for a long time, so we have a lot of research. Good. We encourage people to do the research, especially if you want to share your faith in, a, uh, in an intelligent manner with a Latter-day Saint. Don't assume. Always find out what is it that the church teaches, but then ask Good. them, what is it you believe? And let them tell you, and then you can say, well, that's interesting you say that because this is what your church has taught. Well, Eric, I'm a huge fan of MRM and uh, wanted to use my platform to get as many people to go to your site, follow your ministry. I appreciate that. It was fun working on the book, uh, sharing the good news with Mormons with you. And uh, let's, let's, let's do this again. For those of you watching, uh, before you take off, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. We have some interviews coming up. We have J.P. Moreland booked coming up soon for a behind-the-scenes interview. Uh, next week, Louis Marcos going to be talking about is Christianity and or Christmas pagan, kind of an interesting, timely discussion to have. And we've got topics like assisted suicide coming up in the spring uh, and some pretty remarkable guests. You will not want to miss it. If you've thought about studying apologetics more in depth, think about joining us at Biola. This channel is sponsored by Biola Apologetics, where I teach. 
and every couple of years we have a weekend seminar fully on uh, engaging Mormonism and understanding Mormonism. So this is a part of what we do. So we'd love to have you come study. We have just gone, I don't know if you knew this or not, Eric, but we have just gone fully distance with our program. It's been wow. years in coming, but now people can do it around the world entirely distance from the number one ranked apologetics program. And then if you're like, I'm not ready for a master's, we have a certificate program and we love to guide and walk you through how to learn apologetics. So uh, again, Eric, don't disappear. Hang on. But thanks so much for watching. Hope to see all of you. Let, on our next let me do a quick plug. I mean, what you're saying is so true. Christians okay. need to get the information. And so going to a quality uh, university like Biola, and you guys are timely because we need uh, uh, online kinds of things. Zoom is huge and all the things that you can do. So I would I would say get the education and study under people like Sean. Well, uh, I think it would be well worth your time and effort. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate you, buddy. We'll see everybody soon.